My name is Eddie Garcia. I've been in the industry for 20 plus years. Um, and I've built from the smallest to some of the largest projects uh, that are out there. And I've been fortunate enough to be a part of several transformations. And I've got some learnings from that that I'd like to share with you. And, and hopefully uh, they'll be of use. So let me start with um, why grassroots. Uh, and in order to illustrate why that would be a good thing, grassroots, I'll, I'll share with you my first major transformation that I was a part of. So about 20 years ago, uh, I joined on with Microsoft and I was still uh, you know, wide-eyed and very excitable about things. And I was really looking forward to my first commercial software release. And the team I joined on with was um, the Service Pack hotfix team for uh, NT, Windows NT. So how many of you guys remember uh, NT4, were even around for NT4? Okay, good. It's not just me. Um, so I was very excited. At the time, let me set the stage a little bit. Uh, Bill Gates and Balmer were flying left and right, all coast to coast, doing interviews with um, different magazines, talking about the, the end of uh, Sun Microsystems. Windows NT was going to take over the glass house. And it was the big, you know, it was, we we're going to take over the world, right? Um, and, you know, I bought into it. I'm working hard on it, getting, getting Service Pack 2 ready. And it goes out the door. And this is my first major software release as a software developer, build engineer. And uh, I look up online the next day to see what are people saying about this. And uh, this is what they were saying about it, right? <laughs> so uh, so I, see some of you, I see some of you nodding your head like you remember this particular service pack. Um, so what went wrong? Uh, at the time, you know, the, the group was very much focused on Windows 2000, or at the time it was NT5, right? And so when Service Pack 2 was ready, there was no servicing team. There was myself, a couple of developers, and then essentially it was like, okay, everybody drop what you're doing on Windows 2000, pull up all your old test cases from when we released NT4, and I'll spend two weeks looking at it, right? You do your best, best effort and dig into it and, and, uh, and find what you can see. And everybody did a great job as best they could, but nobody had, uh, I think it was Norton Enterprise Antivirus installed, and we had made a change to the kernel that broke it, and nobody caught it. So, uh, you know, Bill flies back, Balmer flies back, they're none too happy, and they said, okay, there will be a Windows Sustained Engineering team moving forward. We can't do business like this. We can't do ad hoc anymore. It's grown beyond what it, how we were doing business before. And a year later, there was a Windows Sustained Engineering team, like 150 people with dedicated testers, you know, hardware in the data center, all kinds of stuff that we just did not have before. And I was amazed at how quickly we stood that up, turned it around, got the processes in place, I mean, everything. It was amazing. Um, but it also did me a little bit of a disservice in that that's what I thought transformations were like. And you could just pop it around in a year and it's done. And that's not the case, right? So we're going to go through a couple of cases that uh, followed on from that. And uh, the first one is the Microsoft Mac Office. And I had moved to the Mac Office team. They had asked me to come in to do some, some DevOps work for them. Um, and I hit some interesting challenges, technical and non-technical. Um, when I moved into the Mac Office team, I expected to get this, right? Enthusiasm. Because that's what Bill got. He arrived, they said, we're going to have a sustained engineering team. Enthusiasm. Like a year later, it was up and running. Uh, that's not... That's not how it usually works, right? Uh, I had no authority to get anything passed or done. Uh, it was uh, something that management wanted, but they weren't gonna completely stick their neck out for it. They said, we, we recognize we need this. There's a lot of Mac stuff coming. We can't support things the way they are, but you know, uh, do the best you can. So this is more of what I came in contact with. Um, so fear. Apathy, skepticism, anger. Fear, usually in these situations, you hit uh, because people are saying, hey, I, I'm spending all of my day keeping the system up and running. I know, where, I know where it falls down. I know how to pick it back up. My whole day is filled with this. What am I going to be doing? You say you want to make this well-oiled machine that's just popping all the time and putting builds out. What am I going to be doing? This is my job. I spend all my time doing this. My general answer to that is, hopefully something that's a lot more interesting than what you're currently doing, right? You don't want to be doing that. That, that is, to me, that's, that's death. Um, apathy. A lot of times 
people that are in a system that is so heavy with process, heavy with issues that are known, you're going to hit them time in, time out. Um, and maybe you don't have a lot of support from your management to invest back into the process and clear some things out. Uh, they get kind of beat down by that process and they spend all their energy just trying to get the build out every day. There's no mental energy left at the end of the day to say, let's carve this piece out and, and improve it. Um, and skepticism, you know, been there, done that. We tried to do that here. We're special. That doesn't work for us. I'm sure some of you guys have heard that. Um, and then anger, uh, particularly with the Mac office team. Uh, I'm an ex Windows build engineer and I'm coming onto the Mac office team to tell them how to do software, right? That's not going to sit pretty with a lot of, a lot of people. Um, so if we go to the challenges uh, for Mac office, some of the challenges we faced were we had very long build test cycles, 22 hours for two languages, for English and Japanese. That's what we did in Redmond. Uh, yeah, so then again, so only two of them were here. The rest of the languages were processed in Ireland uh, with a completely different process. They would take our outputs and they would run some other process and get those things localized and, and tested. Uh, and then our, our release, once we had our final build, was like 40 business days to get it out, all the other languages added and all of that tested, signed off, and all of that good stuff. So, um, and one of the particular things I faced at, at Mac Office uh, was skepticism. And so skepticism is, for me, out of the things that I put up there as an array of, of reactions you can get, uh, skepticism for me is good. It's a motivator. I get very motivated when people are skeptical. They don't see that it can happen or this is a special situation. It's not going to work for us. I get very motivated to try to figure out a way to show them that this, this can happen. Um, but this particular uh, skepticism was uh, a, a little bit special. I moved them to my office. They were just releasing, I think, uh, Mac Office 2010 or something. And uh, I was moved in right next to the release manager. And uh, she's a great, a great woman, had a great sense of humor. She came over to talk to me and said, hey, you know, what, what are your plans? What are you trying to get done with this product? And I said, oh, we're going to cut the build times to, you know, like by two thirds. And we're going to like get all the languages moved over here. And I was telling her all this stuff. And she was just kind of looking at me like, bless his heart. You know, he, at least, you know, his heart's in the right place. Right. But, you know, it, it's not going to happen. And she kind of went back off to her office. And then, you know, ne sure enough, the next few weeks, it was the release process, all kinds of manual things happening and laying out the disk images. No, the icons in the wrong place and all kinds of stuff. Right. Very, very manual. Um, and then I hear this. So, so you guys recognize that? So. So I'm telling you, she, she, was, uh, she was a character. So I would hear that after like the third or fourth week, day in, day out, she would just randomly play it in the middle of the day. And by the, by the third time I heard it, I was like, I'm gonna get this process fixed. Like we're not gonna be dealing with this anymore. Um, and so, so we did. Uh, here's some of the results. Uh, we were able to um, get the days to release from 42 around to 14 business days. We went from uh, from the build and deploy cycle of 22 hours to eight hours. Now, that's good. That's really good. But what that doesn't tell also is that we went from 22 hours for two languages to eight hours for all 16 languages built and tested at our location. Uh, and that's what allowed us to get the quick turnaround 14 days for all languages at the end of the release. Uh, and then we, we uh, well, actually, that goes over all the situations there, right? Uh, it, was a, it was a challenge, and one thing I guess one thing I want to notice here is, if you look at 2010, 2011, and we started about mid or towards the end of 2010, it's about 18 months, 14 months where it's, everything's flat, like nothing, no progress is really being made there, right? So it's just something to note. So my next assignment, uh, I left Microsoft, joined uh, Blueware, and we're a consulting firm, and when you're a consultant, there are very uh, different challenges. You come in. You're given a specific job, a specific role, do this. And so the team I came in on, the product I came in on as an individual contributor, uh, I saw these same types of problems. And I said, okay, I, I, need, I know how to fix this. I know the kinds of things we need to do. Um, oops. Oh, you, you guys can't see that, okay. Uh, so the, the test cycles, build test cycles were about 10 hours long. Uh, different challenges. It's not a software company. It's not, 
it's not anywhere where things happen quickly. You don't have control of your machines. You can't re-image a machine in under eight days. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, obstacles. And there's a change averse culture. There's a lot of red tape to get uh, anything changed and done. And the biggest issue for me was, this is the main thing I was facing, which is apathy. And for me, that's my Achilles heel. Like the, the uh, skepticism, it gets me pumped up and juiced. Apathy st saps all my strength, right? I'm, I try to go some, do some stuff over here, everything's, mm, maybe we'll do that, maybe we won't. Uh, so I finally found a way to, to, to break past that. And the, I was sorry guys, I was over here. So that's apathy, that's what I was dealing with. The way to break past that is inspiration, inspiring people. Uh, people don't want to change, uh, or they, people change all the time. They don't want to be changed. Uh, and for you to be able to get some momentum on what you're trying to get done, they kind of have to be able to see the world as you're seeing it, as you're forecasting how it can be. And so the only way you can do that is inspire them, enable them to see those things that you are seeing. And so the process that I went through with it is to go through and identify several teams that have a lot of pain in your current existing system and interview them, talk to them, find out what their workflows are, what are the bottlenecks, where are they having the biggest pain? And then from those teams, identify a team that has some people that have that spark, that, that kind of see what you're talking about. Maybe they're not quite believing what you're gonna do, but they're interested in seeing more. So identify that team, make a small win from that. For me, it was the QA team. Their test runs were six hours long. They uh, have a very difficult time to navigate to their images. It's a graphical tool for testing. Uh, difficult to view the differences and difficult finding the cause of the breaks. So this goes to Squish Madness. Squish is the tool they use for testing. It's a graphical test tool. And the tool we were using at the time, uh, we had electric flow, but it was not being utilized. It was another product and it, not much customization had been done to it. So you had to wait six to seven hours for the test run, then do like eight clicks down in the menu system and then get this flat file representation of all the images that failed. Um, not good, right? That would definitely uh, take some time. So the first thing we did was I put uh, electric flow in place and uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it, but there's all kinds of post-processor stuff and things that you can do to filter out things from the logs. And I used that to we parallelized all the tests out, got it down to about uh, 48 minutes or so for 118 tests. And uh, then that top line you'll see there is, again, the top line you'll see there is a summary of the, uh, the current run. How many tests have run? What's the pass rate on the uh, verification points? Um, all kinds of statistics at a glance, real time as everything is running. For the failed tests here, you'll get the actual error messages in the summary and you can click on that and it'll take you right to the log where the error occurred and you can start debugging while the actual test run is still going. Um, and so the, the QA team was pretty happy with that, but I'm, I was like a, a, a sales guy, I was like, there's more, wait. And so we did automated reports. These reports they had to generate by hand uh, 40, 45 minutes a day for the main branch, only one branch. They couldn't generate reports for the other branches because it was all a very manual process. We completely automated it. For every CI, they got reports. For every branch, they got reports. Um, but I took it a level further than that to really get some inspiration going. And that is the viewing of the images and how the test failed. They had to wait to the end go down, you saw the flat image. Here, as the tests are failing with images, I'm popping up links for a web report that they can go and look at and investigate. This is all using one common workflow and using flow for that. So this is the, the web app that I created to then linked into uh, Electric Flow. And they can click to this uh, app, they can see this is the test that failed, these are all the verification points that failed for it, and they can scroll, uh, they can go through and look at the diff image and say, okay, this is what's going on, this is the kind of failure we're having. And when the QA team saw this, they got very, very excited. Like, this is saving us all kinds of time. Uh, we don't have to go digging around. Developers now are interested in looking at the test failures themselves because they can find them and they don't have to figure out how to find them. It's very easy. There's the test name. Um, and so, 
that's when we kind of built up some momentum and the QA team, the, the two guys that uh, I started working with, I identified early on, uh, we started ideating about things. We were having lunch. You know, this is about building the culture, right? You identify some people, you solve some problems for them, you build some excitement and you take that and run with it. We were doing lunches, the, uh, the cafeteria, ab above the cafeteria where we ate, there's a, a, like a big putting green. So we started a tradition that we eat a quick lunch, we go up there, we putt for the rest of our lunch hour, and we're talking about all the problems we're doing. We started doing a happy hour once a week, and we really built momentum around this. And they started ideating, well, maybe you could do something like this. You know, one of the other problems that we have to face is that when the images do start failing, we have to go collect those images, convert them, check them back into the tree, and show them these are the new good images. So we built this tool that gets to launch again from this one workflow, from one tool, they get to launch this, it brings in the, the VP, uh, the verification points that they want to update. They can click, click update VPs, it copies everything locally, converts everything, creates a change set for them, ready for review, and then they can just check it in. That saved them a lot of time too, hours. Um, so we've got some results here as well. Uh, the green bars are tests, the numbers won't me measure up. On the far left is 118 tests. On the far right, it's 155 tests. And as you can see, in the last two years, they've been writing a lot of tests. There's not a lot of incentive to write tests if your test run is seven hours long, right? But if it's 50 minutes long, hey, let's, let's load up on tests. And we're not even using the capacity of our lab. Um, the, the build, and test, and deploy went from 10 hours to four and a half hours. And uh, our CI run times went from two and a half hours to, you could barely see it there, but it's about 25 minutes. And this really got everything pumping and moving for us. Um, and the key here was to find the people that are most affected and get them on board. And they became my salespeople. I didn't have to go out and promote anymore. I could be heads down and they were out saying, man, you need to talk to this guy. He's doing some stuff. And they were jumping in and helping out as well. Um, so, but if you saw the graphs, there was flat for the first two years, first 14, 18 months. And I started to think to myself, because this is a lot of hard work, and it's how do I convince everybody? How do I get things moving faster? And the, the way you get it moved faster is to be an effective change agent, right? You're from the bottom up. You don't have any power. You don't have any authority. All you can do is motivate, inspire people. So empathy, empathy is there for the fear and the anger. If you can get to look at the problem from the eyes of the people that are feeling fear and anger, you can tailor the message to be sensitive to their concerns. They're real concerns, they're valid concerns. Uh, they don't see another way about it. You can tailor that message and try to calm them down about that. Persistence, you're obviously gonna hit a lot of roadblocks, especially if you're from the grassroots, you're starting from the bottom up. You're not gonna be able to just power through a lot of things. So work at it, work at it, don't give up and have a very clear vision of what and why you're trying to do it, right? This is so you can communicate to the people you're trying to get motivated and trying to build a movement with. And it's also so that when you're getting past your roadblocks and you're very persistent and you're, you know, it can take weeks to get past a certain roadblock, you can pivot immediately back to your very clear, concise vision and not lose any time and not lose any effort and just go right back down that path. Um, and then, your, uh, your inspiration, like I said, people, they're not necessarily averse to change. They just they want to be changed, right? They want to feel like it's coming from them. And the only way that's going to happen is if you give them some tooling, give them some way of seeing a slice of what the future is going to look like for them. And then you're, you're going to have very, very motivated uh, people to work with you and partners to work with you. Um, last year, I, I came and I presented. Uh, I was a, a, a panelist. And uh, this year I've been invited back and I brought my number one guy, QA guy. And he was the first one, one of the first ones that I started this with. Uh, he's a geologist slash QA person. Now he's pivoted very much to DevOps and release management. And I call his transformation from rocks to DevOps. <laughs> but he's really caught the spirit, right? He knows, he sees. And the other thing is I came in as an individual contributor for this as an outside consultant. What's happened at this point is the business has come back to us and said, we've got a portfolio of five products. We want you to manage those five products and do the exact same types of things that you've done to this product, to those other products. So while I agree, and it's great, if you can get the top down, if you can get that movement for the whole company, it's awesome. 
if you're stuck at the bottom of your own value chain and you're like, what do I do? Like nobody's trying to do anything or I hear some people talking about it, but by the time it trickles down over here, you're, you're empowered. You can do things. Jump in, find, find your own value chain, map where the problems are, attack the biggest problems, find people that you can team up with and build a movement. And so I wish I could spend more time talking about uh, building a movement, but I only have uh, wait, about four minutes left and this particular video I found does it in three minutes and it does it way better than I could possibly do it. So we'll go on with this. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. Oh, it's on YouTube. Uh, I think look for leadership in three minutes or something like that. Yeah, yeah, or start starting a movement in three minutes. Yeah, something like that, or first follower, yeah. But that, that is the key, right? So that's what I'm talking about is creating that culture. It's all, it's all about the culture. If you find a small group of people and that thing builds on itself, the energy builds and it, it radiates out. I'll also tell you that at the company I'm at, I'm, I'm contacted by people across the ocean saying, we heard that you did some stuff with Squish and these are the results you're getting. And I'm like, I don't know how they heard it. But the word starts traveling, right? And they say, we'd love to work with you. Can we please see what your tools are? Can we share that? Um, it just kind of builds on its own. So I know you can, it's easy to feel like you don't have a lot of power from the grassroots part of it, but you can start doing things and build upon that. Yep, so I've got, that's okay. So I think that's about the end of my time. I got about 20 seconds, so I don't know if I can take a question or not, but I'm happy to talk to anyone. Uh, is my contact information up there? Let me go back. Okay, yeah, so if, if you have stories of your own or if you have any questions, but I would love to hear your stories and your success stories and what you've been able to do um, and what techniques maybe you found that works. Thank you.